Good morning. I uh, I said hello to Tom, and um, we had met before, and he um, told me he wasn't here last Sunday because he had run into a friend from an old church who said, let me, you know, give you a ride to that church. So he went to that church. And, <laughs> and we call that Providence. And that's the lesson you missed from uh, last Sunday on Providence. Well, uh, Luke chapter 7, please turn there. Uh, the seventh chapter marks the beginning of a new section in his gospel. A felicitous thing uh, for those of us in this class since we've had a bit of a gap in our uh, study, about a month since we uh, last opened up the Gospel of Luke for our study, and this new section allows us to take it up again in sync with Luke's new direction. The time gap <clears throat> is uh, surely uh, uh, my fault. Uh, Cindy and I indulged ourselves in some travel, and I thank uh, Chris Spawn for filling in uh, for me, but uh, truth is it's also Peter Lilback's fault, uh, who unwittingly uh, delayed our return to the gospel, and aren't you glad he did, because uh, what a wonderful lesson uh, we received from him on uh, the providence of God over the affairs of our lives. And I've been truly reminded of it uh, several times since uh, as the jumble of uh, issues and people and news, both good and bad, have avalanched uh, over us in the last week, and I know you as well, uh, since we heard that lesson. The doctrine of providence uh, produces in us the conviction uh, that all news, uh, every circumstance, uh, whether we call it good or bad, uh, is good in his, in his providence. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So it stuck with me all week. Well, we're going to read the first 10 verses of Luke chapter 7, a self-contained account that focuses on two men. Uh, one is, as you heard in uh, Warren's prayer, a noble centurion, and the other is the Lord Jesus. As is often the case, Matthew's uh, gospel also includes the account as in, in Matthew chapter 8, and the slight differences uh, between how the two narrate the story, which I won't spend much time on, reflect though the different purposes that each of those gospel writers uh, brought to their gospels. But Luke, notably, uh, gives us the fuller description of this Gentile centurion and uh, marks his first transparent nod to the inclusion of Gentiles in God's kingdom plans. Remember, it was Luke also who brought to our attention in later in Acts chapter 10, another prominent uh, Gentile, uh, Cornelius, who uh, the Lord gave the gift of faith and he and his whole family uh, were brought into God's kingdom and, and were saved by the power of the Spirit and through the preaching of the gospel. And both that account and this one <clears throat> provide examples of the fact that God is willing to accept all men and women alike, uh, no matter gender, obviously, no matter uh, ethnicity or, or status, the common denominator of all of them is the sovereign working of the Spirit of God in bringing them into a saving relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we read, uh, we will observe two men uh, with much emphasis on the one leading the reader to ask, who is uh, this man whose remarkable faith uh, overwhelms uh, our own sometimes measly faith? Uh, remember Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, which brought the sixth chapter uh, to a close, and we haven't looked at it for a few weeks now, but you remember um, it, it challenged, the end of his sermon there challenged his listeners to consider uh, how solid their own faith 
uh, was and whether or not it was the sturdy uh, foundation of faith that would withstand the inevitable uh, storms of this mortal life. And the, the centurion is going to prove to be an example of such faith. But the man's own words and actions uh, point us to the other uh, man and uh, have us consider, who is this man, the Lord Jesus? So let's read it, uh, 10 verses. When Jesus had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. You know Capernaum? It was a town, a city that he spent, he and his disciples spent quite a bit of time in, and it appears quite often in the gospel. So um, when he f completed that, that sermon, he went to Capernaum. And a centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, uh, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Uh, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And I just want to say something very quickly. This was not a slam necessarily against Israel. He did find faith in Israel, not as much as would have been expected. But rather, this is a comment on the centurion's uh, faith. I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. So Luke begins by telling us that Jesus went to Capernaum, and it was there that he met up eventually with a centurion and his slave. We're, not, we're told later that it was he who had built the synagogue that was the focal point of the Jewish community there. So the centurion would have been more than aware of the affairs of the community uh, there in Capernaum. For example, in John's Gospel, in the fourth chapter, uh, there is the account of the royal official whose son was sick in Capernaum. We, uh, Dan led us through that about a, a month ago. And this royal fish, official had come to Jesus uh, seeking his healing powers. And Jesus healed him uh, with, with a mere uh, word, saying, uh, go, your son lives. And John described uh, how the man uh, believed him and, and, and started off to uh, return there when his slaves met him. You remember this, and uh, saying that his son was living. It was yesterday at the seventh hour, uh, they said. And the official knew it was at, at that hour that Jesus had told him, your son lives. So uh, we have here now this centurion, uh, familiar uh, with uh, the goings-on, uh, not out of touch with what was happening in his domain, but personally aware, who had uh, not a son, but uh, not a son who was sick, but a slave, and yet Luke recounts uh, highly regarded by him. In, in verse 7, notice, he'll actually refer to him by a word that may be translated servant, but in certain contexts, uh, stands more as an affectionate term for boy. You may see that in the margin 
of your Bible, and that's probably the case here, I think. He, he regarded the, the servant as a member of his household. It, it at least stresses the affection that, that he had uh, for uh, the slave. The boy was at the point of death, and the centurion responded as one would, who, who greatly loved uh, the child. And he had heard about Jesus. Uh, Luke doesn't say that he had had a personal encounter with him, but what he had heard uh, spurred him to seek after him. But he didn't apparently approach him directly, uh, though Matthew's version of the incident may seem to indicate he did. Matthew writes in chapter 8 and verse 5 that when Jesus entered Capernaum, uh, the centurion came to him. That's how uh, Matthew uh, describes it. However, However, that was more than likely Matthew's shorthand for the process the centurion used in approaching the Lord. He, he wants to get to the point of the story more quickly, and it's not uncommon, think about it, in, in discourse to describe what a person does through agents as if he did it himself. Uh, we do that ourselves when we say something like, we cleaned out the garage this weekend. Only it wasn't literally we, it was, it was she. We call that <laughs> the, the royal we, don't we? It's the royal we. Well, here, uh, Luke, Luke, the gospel writer, was underscoring the centurion's character and especially his humility, his humility in general, certainly, uh, but especially his humility as regarded his approach to the Lord Jesus. He clearly had a high regard for the Jewish people and their religion. And we may even speculate that he was himself what's known as a God-fearer, uh, someone who accepted that the God of the Jews was the true God and yet did not uh, 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 make himself a proselyte to Judaism. We're familiar with centurions uh, through our reading of uh, the New Testament. They were commonplace throughout the Roman Empire. The title centurion uh, literally describes one who was a commander over a hundred. Those of you who know language, centurion a hundred. Uh, but it wasn't always e exactly so. Uh, the term was somewhat flexible and described a mid-level commander higher in rank than what was known as a decurion, an officer in command of 10, and the higher rank commander known as a kiliarch, who was in charge of a thousand. Uh, today we might think of a centurion as uh, something like our army captain. Centurions appear, <clears throat> as I said, several times in the New Testament and in every case, they are portrayed in a favorable light. It was a centurion, for example, who stood at the foot of the cross. And after Jesus died, he declared, truly, this man is the Son of God. And uh, in Acts uh, chapters 22 and 24, uh, it was a centurion, uh, Luke tells us, who rescued Paul, the apostle, when he had been seized and was about to be scourged, and yet another centurion uh, who guarded Paul when he was under house arrest and who allowed him that freedom that he had to meet with his friends and, and, and have care. So Luke presents to us here a, a portrait of an important man with a great need. Uh, his servant was beloved and at death's door. <laughs> Uh, living and working in the vicinity of Capernaum, he had learned about Jesus and his amazing powers. And apparently the more he learned about him, the higher he elevated him in his own estimation. And the higher he elevated him, the more inclined he had become to communicate with Jesus Christ, not directly, but through elders of the, the Jews. It may also have been that he was sensitive to that contemporary Jewish belief that entry into a Gentile home rendered the pious Jew 
uh, unclean. But as Luke continues with the account, we're more inclined to see in his sending of the delegation an act of humility and deference to the greatness of the man he was seeking. The Jewish elders themselves certainly held a high opinion of the centurion. When they came to Jesus, Luke writes in verse 4, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. That's a, that's a big deal. Uh, this man uh, built the Jews their synagogue. And this is very interesting. Uh, the centurion loved the nation of Israel. He had been drawn to the God that they uh, worshiped, likely uh, to also to the scriptures that they revered. It was the spirit of their God who had been leading him in that direction. And by that spirit, he had been enabled to distinguish between the folly of paganism with its dismal projection of man's weaknesses upon the gods and that elevated uh, picture of an almighty yet also loving and gracious and merciful God revealed in the pages of scripture. Not only that, they say, uh, but the centurion had actually built uh, their uh, synagogue. And I read this, but uh, uh, the giving of contributions by Gentiles to help uh, Jewish communities remodel their synagogues was not that rare. It did uh, happen. And yet uh, for a Gentile to undertake upon himself the entire burden of building one, uh, was an indication of something far more than what was common. So th this would lead us to believe that the link, here's my point, the link between the centurion and Jesus was closer even than we might think for the sacred building in which Jesus had already, we know this from the Gospels, Jesus had already revealed his authority and power was the building that the centurion had financed himself. And so all of these attributes of the man from uh, the Jewish elder's perspective uh, qualified him to receive from Jesus his special attention. He is worthy, they said, for you to grant this to him. And I want you to notice, at least in our English translations, how that descriptive term appears three times in the space of four verses. In verse four, uh, he is worthy. In verse six, I am not worthy. And in verse seven, I did not even consider myself uh, worthy. Uh, one's worth or lack of worth becomes a significant theme in the encounter. And there seems to be a true difference of opinion. For on the one hand, uh, the elders deem the centurion worthy. But on the other, the centurion himself insists he is not. And there's no chance that it's an instance of false humility. Uh, Jesus would have seen right through that, wouldn't he have? Which side had it right? Well, Kent Hughes observed that the elders had it partially right. Uh, the centurion was certainly a lover of Israel and a generous uh, benefactor of her people. But their insistence that he was worthy, he wrote, worthy to have Jesus heal his servant was their own spin. But it reflected, if you think about it, the typical attitude of official Judaism as we see it reflected throughout the Gospels that a person could earn God's approval and gain entry into his kingdom by virtue of law keeping or, or works of valor. Uh, surely this man in their eyes who had shown, by, uh, shown himself by his deeds to be so generous 
and so good and so magnanimous even in exercising his goodwill upon a people not even of his own race. Surely the centurion had merited the special favor of the amazing rabbi. This may not be the, the definitive passage in the Bible against the notion that one can earn God's approval and earn heaven by virtue of human activity or human works, but it is without doubt illustrative of it. Both the Old Testament and the New uh, emphasize over and over that all our righteous deeds are but filthy rags and that it is by grace that we are saved through faith. That not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not of works. It's not a result of works. The appraisal of these Jewish elders, uh, he is worthy, is an understandably generous as understandably generous as they intended it to be, but it contradicted the tenor of the entirety of God's word. Uh, that appraisal, as well meaning as they intended it, would be confounded by the man himself. But look there in verse six, Jesus himself was not deterred. Uh, Luke says simply, that Jesus then started on his way with them. Matthew records that he responded, I will come and heal him. God is patient with us. Jesus is God. Jesus is patient with men. Impatient people can learn a lot by examining his behavior. I doubt we have many impatient people uh, in here. But we may surmise that the elders' words would have grated upon the ears of any who understood grace and the insufficiency of human works, but they appear not to have affected the Lord. Uh, the question at hand was not whether he could heal the lad, but whether he would heal him. And he took no time uh, to correct the elders. He was rather always on the alert for hearts reaching out to him. So he wasted no time in making his way there where there was a heart reaching out to him. The elders had said that the centurion was worthy, but when the centurion heard that Jesus was nearing his house, he's actually almost there, it appears he was overcome with a sense of his own unworthiness. He sent friends in verse 6 saying to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. So here on display was the true humility of the man, uh, the esteem he had for Christ and the faith he was exhibiting were combined with a sense of his own unworthiness. And again, I, I want you to notice uh, something here uh, that I think is at least interesting. I pointed out uh, the three occurrences of our English word worthy, uh, the Greek words translated that way in verses four and seven are identical. Oxios, some of you know that word meaning worthy but it's a different word uh, in verse six translated that way, hikonos, which means something like fit or to be adequate for. Now it may be that the words are just used interchangeably. We do that ourselves in, in conversation. Uh, or it could be that by fit, the centurion was pointing to his status as a Gentile. He was not fit to enjoy the fellowship with the Lord that would be implied by his coming in to his home, or as he actually says, coming under uh, my roof. 
But by pointing this out, it allows me to quote from Alfred uh, Edersheim regarding the true worthiness of the centurion being found in his modest assessment of himself, that in his self-acknowledged unfitness lay the real fitness of this good soldier for membership with the true Israel. And in his deep felt unworthiness, the real worthiness, the real oxios for the kingdom and its blessings. It was this utter disclaimer of all claim, Edersheim wrote, outward or inward, which prompted that absoluteness of trust which deemed all things possible with Jesus and marked the real faith of a true Israelite. The centurion was blessed in that way. We remember from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, all uh, must be blessed by being poor in spirit in the awareness of our sin and our own unworthiness before God. And therefore, the man felt constrained uh, to say to Jesus, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. That precious boy will be healed. Just say the word. Say the word, and he'll be healed. Perhaps unwittingly, the centurion voiced the same great truth of our Psalm 33 uh, from last Sunday. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was. He commanded, and it stood fast. The power is in his word. And the centurion we might say doubly knows that through his own experience. That's what he means now in verse 8 when he states, For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And and to my slave, do this, and, and and he does it. We actually see that authority in the body of our passage, if if you look. In in the third verse, he sent the elders, and they went. In verse 6, he sent friends, instructing them what to say, and they went and did what he told them to do. So since the, here's the explanation. This verse can be confusing, so... Uh, But this this is the explanation. Since the centurion is under authority himself, he understands delegated authority. Even in his own case, if, if his own authority is limited by his own subordination to some higher in command, still his orders are carried out. Under the same rule then, even more so, Jesus who wields a completely independent authority and indeed holds the entire universe in his hands, sustaining it by his very word, can command what he will and what he wills will be done. When he says, I will heal him, then he will be healed. That was the understanding behind the centurion's faith. Though he was poor in spirit, he was rich in faith. And Jesus noticed already the boy must have been healed for the final verse affirms that when the friends returned, they found him in good health. But the Lord did not want the moment to pass without remarking on the faith of the centurion. Uh, Luke says that he marveled at him and even turned to address Uh, the crowd that had been following after him. I say to you, uh, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Only twice in the Gospels is Jesus recorded as marveling at people here on account of a man's faith. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, at the lack of faith in his hometown in Nazareth, he marveled at their unbelief. Jesus is impressed by faith, and he's impressed by humility. Uh, The world is filled with men and women 
who believe that God, if there is a God, is impressed by our behavior or by our accomplishments or by our works of sacrifice and, and deeds of goodness or compassion. The visible church actually has been infiltrated by religious copycats who think that church attendance or committee, sur co yeah, committee service or, or, or buildings named at, for them or notoriety within or without the church bring God's approval and guarantee them heaven when they die. They seek worthiness in their own accomplishments. And I know you're just like me and you have to watch out for that. You're prone to it just like I am, to seek worth in our accomplishments. But God calls blessed those who follow the example of the centurion and recognize that in and of themselves, they are not worthy of the Lord's goodwill. Yet they have faith that he is a savior. He is a savior and he has accomplished everything that they need to meet his approval in the Son of God. Those are the two men of our passage. The, the centurion with great faith and more importantly, uh, the, the Savior who is the object of our faith, who is the reason that we got in our cars and drove here this morning to come and hear about him. It's the main lesson of our passage. We are sinners alienated from God, unable to mend our brokenness, but he's a wonderful savior. We are nothing but lost sinners, condemned to suffer under God's just penalty against our sin and incapable of remedying it unless he draws us to him in faith in his son. And that's the reality behind the centurion's faith. The Lord had gifted him with it. He had drawn him to himself. And then when he exercised it, Jesus praised him for it. Isn't that a remarkable thing? He gave it to him, and then he praised him for it. Well, I'm pretty sure I've shared this with you before, but uh, the day my father died, I found out immediately after Dan had delivered a sermon out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It was July 4th, and after the service, I made a beeline uh, to my car, I think to get on with holiday plans, but... Uh, I was met there by a, a string of email messages telling me that my uh, dad had died. Now, he was a faithful believer, my father was, uh, but a quiet and, and humble one. He, overcome his, he overcame his bashfulness to actually teach Bible classes at their church. He, I think, had nightmares that it found himself standing in front of the church t to give announcements and he didn't have any clothes on. <laughs> but my father was not one to get up there in the pulpit and deliver a sermon. He was a quiet, steady, humble Christian. Now I mention this because the fifth verse of 1 Corinthians 4 which Dan had just exposited that morning says this, therefore we do not go on passing judgment before the time, <clears throat> but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Each man's praise will come to him from God. And Dan commented on that. He's, you know what he said? He said, how wonderful. I wrote it in my Bible. It's still there. How wonderful to think that God might one day praise us. And I remembered it 
uh, that day, as I thought about my dad, he had a great faith uh, given to him uh, by the Lord. And when he came face to face with him, the Lord praised him for it. What a savior. Uh, the poor in spirit uh, truly are blessed. And that lesson is in here. That, that, that lesson is here. He was a man poor in spirit, but rich in faith. And may that be our own posture, you and me, by God's grace, his good gift to us. Let's ask him for it. Lord, uh, th that's what we desire um, because you have planted that in our hearts. You've communicated it to us uh, in your word. And uh, we want to be humble. We want to be poor in spirit. Uh, we're sinners, and it's difficult because we like to place ourself, ourselves on the throne. Uh, we like to, we love the praise of, of men. Uh, but Lord, we want uh, humility and we want faith. Uh, Lord, help my unbelief. Give me more of faith. That's, that's the prayer of each one of us here today. May our faith uh, grow uh, more and more and uh, be pleasing to you. Uh, we pray for that. We thank you for a Savior. Uh, it's the reason we're here, that you uh, sent your Son. You didn't spare him. You, you sent him that he might uh, bear the burden and the penalty for our sins upon himself and please you ultimately and satisfy uh, your righteous wrath against our sin so that we might live and have life. We thank you in, in Jesus' name. Amen.